George Lundestrater. <laughs> Very best. Yep. I'm feeling really underdressed now. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, we praise and thank you for your goodness. And Lord, we just rejoice that out of all the people of the world, that those who know you as Lord and Savior, that we understand the whole message of Christmas more than anybody else. Because we've been recipients of your grace and your mercy. We know the reality of what it is to kneel at the foot of the cross, sinners, hopeless, lost, and to receive that free gift of salvation in yourself. And to know the reality of standing on our feet, having been washed in the wonderful blood of Jesus Christ. And to know the reality of sins forgiven. And Lord, we just thank you that at this time of the year, that as we remember your advent, we also let our eyes go forward to the fact that the cross is coming. And Lord, we thank you that as your people, we can look back on the Calvary event, knowing that at that time, all things were laid to rest. And that if your mission was finished, the power of sin was broken, and we were redeemed and set free, and we give you glory. And Lord, in that time, in the time you put us here on earth, <coughs> we just pray that you administer to us and empower us and shape and mold us, that we might become the men and women that you desired us to be, that we would be about the master's business, to be doing those good works that you called us to do, so that we can indeed be the salt and the light in a deepening, darkening world. Thank you, King Jesus. Amen. Amen. Two weeks ago when I preached, we were looking at fleshly flashpoints. And those were those things in our life where the, the flesh or the circumstances that lead up to the flesh being able to get dominion over us. In all the courses we've been doing, um, in many of the messages, we've been highlighting that battle between the flesh and the spirit. And for those of you who've done the consecration course, who can remember in what phase of our spiritual growth does that, that battle really, it's there or in your face all the time. Who can remember? Phase two. Right. Well done, Samuel. Very good. Phase two. There's that constant battle with the flesh. And you'll remember when we were doing that, and we're going to read from the same two verses we read last time because we continue in that meet. That theme, because we didn't get through it, Galatians 5 verses 16 and 17 say, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Then Romans 8, 7 to 8. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And you'll remember, as we've gone through those courses, and, and last week we touched on it, that it's like there are two boxes in, inside of you, one is the flesh and one is the spirit, and they're constantly fighting to see who's going to get supremacy. And I just really felt led of the Lord when I prepared that message two weeks ago to share with you over four decades those, what I call the flashpoints, those areas, those circumstances that happen in our lives that allows the flesh to get the supremacy, to knock you back, in your spiritual walk or to bring you down in, and into depression in your spiritual walk. And you remember the first one that we looked at, I illustrated it with that lovely modern dance we all do. 
You can remember, no signal. Why don't we have a signal? Because we've moved away from the mobile tower. And the first time or the first circumstance that leads to us being overcome by the flesh is when we move away from God. And I'm just going to quickly run through because some of you weren't here. We move away from God when we want our own way. Lord, I want to do my own thing. We move away from God when we get angry with God. And maybe that's because some circumstances have happened in our life and we don't understand what's happened. And we get angry with God. And I just shared with you briefly, remember that Romans says, God causes all things to work together for good. For those who love the Lord. And effectively, no matter how many deep, dark things happen in your life, know this, that God will turn it around and use it for His glory. And I shared through the years of ministry, there's times when I've been through those times and I've actually got angry with God and said, God, why is this happening? And I don't get understanding until years later when I'm sitting in a counseling room and somebody's battling with something and I say, well, this is what you're feeling. And they ask the question, well, how did you know that? Well, five years ago, I went through that myself. So whatever you're going through now, no matter how dark it is, know that God will turn it around and he will use it for ministry. You know, it's, and I always use the illustration, my wife trained as a midwife. And she used to tell me about when ladies were giving birth and it was, breathe, lovey, it's not so bad. Breathe, breathe, it's not so sore. And then she had her first baby. <laughs> it hurts! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Different perspective. And we need to realize when you've been through something, it changes you that when you encounter somebody else who's going through that same thing, you have compassion, you have understanding, you have insight, and you can minister Jesus to them. So, but people move away from God when they get angry and when they stop feeding themselves. When they get to the point where they rely on just be being fed once a week on a Sunday. Where they're not spending time in the Word of God and allowing God to feed them. Remember Romans 12 earlier on says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. And you need to be feeding yourself that your mind is renewed. We looked at last time, the flesh gets control when we move away from our spouse. When we allow things to, and we looked at that mentally, when we distance ourselves from our spouse, maybe because we're angry or we're just so busy or there's things happening or there's a bit of conflict there. When we move away from our spouse physically, when there's no more physical contact and we touched on intimacy as well. Those are all areas where if that's not happening in our marriages with our spouse, the flesh gets the opportunity to arise. Because you find yourself in a, in a vulnerable position. And very often people will respond to affection, understanding all of those things from somebody on the opposite sex when they are in that vulnerable position. And that's when a lot of things go wrong. The third thing we looked at last time is when we move away from the command to rest. And we looked at many people... <coughs> Feel they've got to be busy, 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 busy all the time. And you know what happens? We get tired. You know what happens when we get tired? We get become vulnerable. And that's when the devil can step in. And remember, we touched on certain personality types. The beavers, the golden retrievers, the beavers will be busy, busy, busy just to be busy. 
and the golden retrievers will go around picking up monkeys. You can remember what's a monkey? The responsibility. You look around and you're picking up everybody else's responsibilities. And you're doing it because if I don't do it, nobody will. And you end up with a martyr complex that I've got to save the world. Folk, news for you. Somebody's already saved the world. His name is Jesus Christ. You've got to do what God's called you to do. And we need to look and say, what are the specific things that God's called me to do? Because there are always going to be needs. Did Jesus feed every single hungry person? No. Did Jesus heal every single sick person in his time on earth? No. And what did Jesus do after a time of busy ministry? The Bible says he withdrew to the mountain or he withdrew to the wilderness to recharge his batteries. Because if we allow ourselves to get physically tired, if we get so many responsibilities, and remember I said if you've got too many monkeys on your back, they turn into a gorilla, and the gorilla will kill you. And when we do this course, it's called monkey business, we tell people that if they've got too many monkeys, and they're turning into gorilla, you've got to shoot some of the monkeys. Because if nobody else is going to feed them, and I know for the golden retrievers now you're saying, oh, I couldn't do something like that. If I don't do it, who's going to do it? There's some things you have to let die. And you see this in churches as well. Where ministries run and suddenly there's nobody to run that ministry anymore. And somebody else will come and they'll pick that up. And they're running their ministry and this ministry and that ministry and this ministry. And... What happens when you spread yourself across so many, you're not able to do one or two things well. So things become very haphazard eventually. And I've seen this so many times in Sunday school. People burn out. I've seen it through the years. They say, I just don't want to do so. I love Sunday school, but I just can't because I'm exhausted. And the very thought of it. And it's at that moment when we are exhausted that the flesh will come in and temptation will come in. We have to allow ourselves to rest because God has designed our bodies to heal when we rest. God has designed our bodies to heal when we sleep. So sleep is part of ministry. And I know I have this argument all the time with Glennis. She's sitting right there. And I say, I, I say to her often, doing nothing is doing something. Because you have to rest. So especially for those of you who are the little Duracell bunnies, rest. Give yourself time to rest. And if you are married to a Duracell bunny, as the spouse, make sure your partner rests. Because if they don't, the flesh will ultimately come in. Fourth thing. It's when we allow the world to inform our choices. When we move away from the word of God and we start to allow what the world or popular things out there are saying that will affect how we think. And I taught for seven years in a um, tertiary situation, in a college situation. And we had one particular lady. Uh, she was she was interesting. She was from England, but living in South Africa. Um, very interesting character. Came to work one day in her pajamas. Um, you know, quite liberal. And her name was Pamela. And she was into all the modern things about how to bring up kids, et cetera, et cetera. And I often would have a discussion with her. I was the vice principal and I said, Pamela, if you go on those things, there is disaster waiting down the road. She said, no, no, but I've read this book and I've read this article and this guy and, you know, and, you know, so many modern parents, it's all the modern ideas of parenting. And I remember one day she 
walked into my office and she was in tears. And she was shattered. And I said, what's wrong? He said, both my kids have gone off the rails. Right off the rails. And in those times, you have to show compassion, but it's also an opportunity to minister the truth. And I said to her, Pamela, for the last three years, I've been saying to you, there's only one way to bring up your children, and that's with this book. And I said, you grab all the philosophies of the world, and you've allowed all that liberal thinking to come in. And what is the result in your children's lives? She was shattered. You see, folk, when we allow the world to inform us of how we should be behaving, and sadly, that is happening. The world, through its pressure on social media and all the change that is happening, it is pushing with huge pressure. And the fleshly part of us wants to ally itself with that because that sin and the fleshly sinful part of us wants to ally ourselves there. And we start to think about the things of the world and oh shame. When in reality, we should be staying far, far away from them. We need to have the courage. And I use that word purposefully. We need to have the courage to look at all the philosophies of the world and hold them against the word of God and say, do, do, do they stand up to what God is saying? Because you speak to many modern parents. They say, oh no, I could never give my children a little spanking. By the way, just quick poll. How many of you have ever had a hiding in your life? Put up your hands. He's got two hands up because he was really cool. Now I want to ask you the question. Did the hiding traumatize you so much that you've never been able to function as a reasonable adult? Or did it shape and mold you? It shapes us and it molds us and it teaches us that there are responsibilities and consequences to our actions. What's happened in the modern world is that we say, oh, don't just let the kid be free to be themselves. Let me translate that into spiritual language. Just let the flesh have full reign. And when the flesh has full reign, you end up with major, major conflict. Because the flesh, by nature, is selfish, by nature is destructive, by nature is not caring. You look at a child handing around a packet of sweets. Mommy says, share the sweets. One for you. Five for me. One for you. Six for me. One for you. Seven for me. Ah, oh, sweets are all finished. Bulging pockets. That's the flesh in action. You want to see the flesh in action? How many of you have experienced at least one lot of road rage this week? Where somebody's just pulled in front of you or sped past you. I must admit, I was tempted to road rage on Thursday night. During the Saturday work function, I dropped her off. And just as I'm coming back from Oldbourne down towards Lillington, just before the motorway, there's a a junction there, and this guy in this big black Audi, 
was coming towards me, indicated he was turning left, turned left, and then suddenly just threw a UE right across the road in front of me. If I, fortunately, I wasn't going fast because I always am very slow around that intersection because, yeah. And I jammed on brakes. I missed him by inches. And he threw the UE and then shot down the road on the other side at high speed because I think he then got scared I was going to follow him. Because that's the world we live in. That is the flesh. I will do what I want to do when I want to do it. And that is the philosophy <coughs> of the world. And if we abandon this book, if we allow the world to inform our philosophy, the flesh will prevail. The fifth thing, where the flesh will always take the opportunity is when we allow things to fill the gap. I've seen this so many times through the years. There was a time when young men would go into the army and do something called national service. And that taught them discipline and it helped them to get their highs, their adrenaline highs. Do you know that in nearly all the surveys in the last 15 years, they ask young people, why do you work? They say, I work to get enough money so that I can go on lovely holidays or I can go skiing every weekend or bungee jumping or extreme rock climbing, or surfing, or cage diving with great white sharks, or what? what's a common denominator in all of those things? Adrenaline. They want a, a, a bigger high. They want to, adrenaline makes you feel, gives you the buzz. And people talk about, Man, I'm really buzzing. What that is, that's the adrenaline. And they're constantly looking for that buzz. And when we allow things to fill the gap that Christ should be filling, the flesh will take over. When we are filling that gap, that, that getting that adrenaline buzz through jumping off cliffs, or going out and purchasing the, the latest 82-inch TV. Then we get home and realize, whoa, we don't have a wall big enough for it. <laughs> when we buy that car, I know some people, they change their car every three to four months. Or oh, somebody just recently, why do you keep changing your car you know what the, the response was they said i get bored easily i get bored easily translate that i've lost that buzz i've lost that adrenaline feeling now as we come into christmas People are going to be looking for a lot of things to fill the gap. Bigger TV, bigger computer, better earbuds, better gaming machine, better car, better, 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 better. And in all those scenarios, the flesh is taking control. I coined a phrase many years ago. I said, when we allow things to fill the gap, whether it's physical things or, or activities, I coined the phrase, the Peter Pan Syndrome. And I saw this more in men 
than in women 30 years ago when I coined this phrase. But it's as prevalent today in women as it is in men. And who can tell me, Peter Pan was the little boy who never grew up. Never grew up. And was constantly looking for more and more fun things to do. And I saw marriages fall apart because the little boy who's now 35 years old still wanted to play and never wanted to take the responsibilities that were needed. We had a very, very good friend. He was part of our church for a while, but as a pastor, I was a little bit too direct. And I challenged him on his Peter Pan syndrome because his marriage was breaking up. And he moved away to a church that was more into the extremes. Sadly, he died. Because one weekend he was out on the motorbike, chasing the adrenaline high, scrambling through the bush, and shooting down one of these bush paths. He didn't know that the man who owned the, the part of the ground had strung wire across to put up an electric fence to keep his animals in. And Nick was just shooting down full ball, full tap. He had long hair, flowing in the wind, enjoying the adrenaline as he hit the wire and he was decapitated. 39 years old, I think he was, eh? 39, 40, around about there. Lovely guy, lovely Christian, loved the Lord. I was always checking that next time. You see, for him, the battle of the flesh was winning all the time because he was constantly looking for that adrenaline. If you're an adrenaline junkie, can I give you some advice about controlling the flesh? Walk into a situation that is very hostile to Jesus. Like a bar, for instance, or pub. And say, can I tell you guys that you're all sinners and that you need Jesus? Let me tell you what, you will get an adrenaline high so quickly. <laughs> you will walk out of there buzzing. <laughs> or get thrown out of there buzzing. You see, what we don't realize is that when we do God's work, that is the best adrenaline high of all. When we've led somebody to Jesus Christ, or we've sat down next to somebody who's broken and falling to pieces, and we minister Jesus to them, and you see Christ starting to do the work in their life, that is the biggest adrenaline high that you could ever, ever imagine. Because the Spirit of God is working. <clears throat> so the flesh will grab hold when we allow things and that quest for adrenaline to fill that space. The sixth area where the flesh will take control is when we allow the world to dictate our self-worth. Across four decades, there have been hundreds and hundreds of people who do not accept deep down what God says about them. And God says that you are wonderful and you are special. He uses the words that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That he knit you in your mother's womb. That he's created good works for you to do even before the creation of the world. You are not a mistake. Your gifts, your talents, your looks, your hair or lack thereof is not a mistake. God has created you, but deep down so many people don't believe that. 
They think they need something else to be worthy. And their self-worth is in literally down ground zero. Through the years, people have said to me, do you know that you're quite arrogant? Glenn, this is having a good laugh. But you know what? I've never accepted that I'm arrogant because I'm not. What I am is supremely confident in what Christ has done in my life. I'm extremely confident in the Word. I'm extremely confident in the giftings that Christ has given me. Because I know who I am. I am a sinner who's been saved by grace, taken from that deep dark place, and been washed and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ and be given a place and an identity and a calling and, in my case, a family. Not just my immediate family, but all of you. The church of Jesus Christ is my family. They're the people I love. They're the people that impact my lives. They are special. Why are they special? Because they're God's people who have been fearfully and wonderfully made, and that God has given you an identity. And the devil comes, and he whispers in your ear, and says, you're no good. And we're constantly trying to be something, when the reality is, you are something. And if Christ has done his work in you, you should stand tall. And stand proud, and I use that word in the biblical sense. Proud in what Christ has done for you. Proud in what God is doing in and through you. And stand firm. Don't grovel. Don't allow the flesh to say, you still need an add-on. And we get so confused because we're living in a day and age where every time you open your email it says, why don't you upgrade? Upgrade your phone. <laughs> upgrade your software. Upgrade your package. Upgrade your email. Upgrade your broadband. Upgrade your looks. Do you know how many billions are spent on plastic surgery? And that's why you go into Instagram or any of the social medias. There's a whole new brand of people. They are called <laughs> influencers. And companies pay them millions to show how they can transform themselves. They'll show you a before picture when they just wake up. And everybody looks and goes, <gasps> and then they'll show you two hours later when they've lathered on all the plastic and the makeup and the moisturizers and everything else that goes with it. And every young person says, oh, I need to look like that. I'm not good as I am. They will spend millions, billions every year trying to be something that they were never, ever created to be. Do not allow the world to dictate your self-worth. If you have Jesus, He will do whatever transformation needs to be done in your life. Don't allow the flesh to tell you that you need a whole lot of add-ons. Are we doing on time? We're nearly done. Seven things. The flesh starts to take control when we move away from fellowship. There are no lone rangers in the kingdom of God. And what happens is the flesh and the things of the flesh and that questing for something else all the time will move you out of fellowship. And you think, well, I, I can be a Christian without being part of a body. No, you can't. That's why God brought the church into being. That's why the church was birthed. To A, go out and tell the good news, but B, to create 
What was the Great Commission? Therefore, go into all the world and make disciples, disciples not converts. It's easy to make a convert. But to make disciples, you need a body. What do they say? It takes a village to raise a child. And it takes a Christian village, a Christian community to raise disciples. To encourage each other, to support each other, to rub off each other. That's what we need. And when we move away from fellowship, that's when the flesh will come in like a flood. And sadly, there are so many people who are relying on these instruments to give them the fellowship that they need. They're not meeting with physical people. They're meeting with cy in cyberspace. There's no accountability. There's no coming alongside of you and saying, how are you doing? They're living their whole lives isolated. And when you live an isolated life, the flesh will reign supreme every time. Every single time, the flesh will reign supreme. Because sooner or later, you will die from the lack of fellowship. And finally, the other area where the fresh will reign supreme is when we harbor willful disobedience or unforgiveness. When God has said to you, I want you to do this. Or he said in his word, as a born again believer, this is how you should be living. This is as a born again believer, this is what you should be doing. And you willfully say, I will not do it. And you're walking in rebellion. And when you walk in rebellion, the flesh will be cheering you on saying, go boy, show your independence. Stand up to that bully God. Who's he to tell you what you should or shouldn't be doing? Because that's what the flesh does. And as long as you walk in willful disobedience to God, the flesh will always reign supreme. But when we humble ourselves, when we repent, the forgiveness of God will come in. And that flesh will be suppressed. And part of that disobedience is unforgiveness. We've been through the 70 times 7 course. I think that should, should be done every year. Not necessarily as a group, but personally. Lord, who have I not forgiven this year? Who have I locked away in my heart? There's certain folk when you use the name... Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> Harold Wilson. If you're an EU supporter, David Cameron. Robert Mugabe. Adolf Hitler. There are certain names that just provoke a reaction. You know what that tells me? You haven't forgiven. You haven't forgiven. They're still locked in your heart. That you're walking in willful disobedience to God because he said, I don't care if he's Adolf Hitler, Robert Mugabe, Margaret Thatcher, or Genghis Khan. Forgive. Because if we don't forgive, we cannot experience that flow of grace to us. It harms us more than it harms that person. And folk, that's at those points, that's where the flesh will come through. And sometimes some of you have been experienced to horrendous things have been done to you. And you carry the pain of that every day. Jesus wants to let that pain go. And the only way that can happen is when you forgive. 
and let the healing of Jesus Christ come in. Some horrendous things have been happening in the world in the last couple of years. And there are going to be a lot of very angry, very hurt people. But if they don't let go with forgiveness, the flesh will rule support. Because hate is a terrible, terrible thing. It destroys not only the person who hates, but all around. So, folk, have you moved away from God? Have you moved away from your spouse? Have you moved away from the command to rest? Have you allowed the world to inform your choices? Have you allowed things or experiences or highs to fill the gap? Are you part of that Peter Pan syndrome? Have you allowed the world to dictate your self-worth? Have you moved away from fellowship? Now you're harboring willful disobedience to God. In all of those scenarios, the flesh will ultimately reign supreme and will destroy you. And that is from four decades of observation, of seeing what happens when the flesh starts to get supremacy. We all battle with the flesh. The important thing is not to let the flesh win that battle. But to constantly be coming to the foot of the cross and saying, Lord, forgive me. And let God bring his healing work in your life. Lord, you've created us to, to be and to do wonderful things for you. But Lord, so often the flesh tries to derail us from the plans and the intentions that God has for our lives. Those wonderful things that you created us to be and to do. And Lord, I just pray that if there's anybody here this morning that is grappling in one or more of the areas we've touched on, and there are others, but these are the main ones through the years that I've seen. I pray, Lord, that you would just minister to them. Remind them that you love them. That you desire to see them live in victory and freedom and forgiveness and love and grace and mercy and help them just to capitulate Lord, to bend the knee and do whatever it needs to be done so that you can work and reign supreme in their lives and Lord I thank you that you're the one who has already won the victory and that when we stand in the identity of who we are in Christ, we can stand with confidence, knowing that if God be for us, then who on earth can stand against us? Thank you, King Jesus. Amen.